Hey, how are you? Hey, I am. I'm actually doing okay. It's been nice to have a pretty solid week. And my son came home on Sunday night. He flew in from Montana and it's great to have him home. We have him home for like, I don't know, a lot of weeks for the holidays. And so our whole family's together and it feels really nice. So yeah, how are you? That's awesome. I'm doing well. I had to think about that for a minute because my day's been up and down. I have had a bunch of anxious moments, but then in the middle of the day, I started, and this is something I do pretty often when things are complicated, I will just pause and read a psalm between some other things that I'm doing. And I am amazed at how often that emotionally reorients me. Uh, Mm. And so if I started the day just a mess, I ended the day feeling pretty good. And I am grateful for that. I'm not sure that I should be surprised that the Bible can change my outlook on life, but (laughs) I often am. Right. Yeah. um, Well, it's the difference between experiential knowledge and head knowledge. And exactly. Somehow those are miles apart sometimes. Yeah. Well, and it does make me deeply grateful. The, The Bible is a gift and I am very thankful for it. Well, okay, so you you talked about the Psalms and the fact that they're a gift. One of the Psalms I struggle to connect with sometimes is Psalm 119 because it is so long and because he's it's kind of repetitive because your by your word is a gift. It's a lamp unto my feet. It's this great thing. It's this great thing. And not that I disagree, but it's so repetitive. Do you connect with that psalm, with I mean, you had an emotional response just now. Do you read that in the psalm, or do you struggle to find it? Okay, um, prepare to be wildly unshocked. Okay, I struggle with any psalm that is longer than about twenty-five verses. Mm. I just have a hard time connecting because I. I something that's long is hard for me. Uh, This is true of poetry in general and long books. It's just true of everything that's long. I do well with things that are short. And so Psalm 119 straddles this in a lot of ways because if I give myself permission to just read one of the stanzas, knowing that it is not trying to make a linear progressive argument, Instead, it is trying to meditate on the topic. And so I'm not dishonoring the writing style if I just pick a a piece of it. I really can savor a piece of it. But if I, I don't know that I've ever even tried to read Psalm 119 in any other way because I don't know that I could. Um, Mm. It's just long. So does that answer that question? It does, and I'm sorry to like put you on the spot there. Uh, just because I don't mind. I that's a psalm I want to like more than I do. I just maybe if I approached it in the way you described, maybe just one stanza, maybe two stanzas at a time, maybe then in eight to sixteen verse chunks, I could feel a little differently about it. Yeah, it feels to me more like if it were being published today, a series of poems that are loosely connected about the same theme, not like one poem the way we would mean it today. Yeah. So it could be published as a, an anthology of poems, all of which are trying to follow the same poetic rules. But if that were the case, I would have no problem opening the book and reading a poem. Hmm. All right. Tips for Psalm 119. Uh, is that what you called for? I, are we done? Did, did no, you? <laughs> that's, that's it. I'm done. I have no other <laughs> thoughts or interests today. I'm done. No, I was thinking, so we are smack in the, the middle of the Christmas season and Christmas is ramping up all around me. And that involves a church Christmas production and it involves for me, flying home, and I was talking to my parents earlier this week, and we were talking about the fact that we have 
this play that we're going to go see that I can tell you more about later, but it's uh, A Christmas Carol by uh, Charles Dickens. And all of this, the songs and, and all of it really just has me thinking about the idea of Christmas traditions. And beyond that, the idea of tradition itself. And so mm. I want to talk about traditions and tradition. A- and I can already tell you want to burst into song. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do have to balance the ledger a little bit because you have done a lot of singing on the podcast. And so it would only be right if I balanced it by, you know, starting out right now with tradition, tradition. Yeah, but. exactly. And thank you. I, I never remember if the character's name is Stevia or Tevia. One of them is like an additive for coffee and one is the guy's name. And <laughs> I, I am always a wee bit confused, but All right. it's Tevia, right? It is Tevia. Stevia is a sugar substitute, if that helps you. Yes, I know. Yes, that's what I meant by additive for coffee. But well, uh, I was I was trying to alliterate with the S's. I have some preacher oh, guy in my life Stevia that said that was a sugar. good idea. Yeah, yeah, got it. Oh, that was a very subtle and linguistically nuanced joke that I did not catch. <laughs> um, but, okay, so but yes, anyway, tradition, tradition. Yes. So I, what do you think? I want to just back up and think about the idea of tradition. I. I like it. I it's funny because I don't think we do tradition very well in our country. We don't have a lot of cultural traditions or at least ones that we that we kind of like market to the world. I don't know. I just I feel like there are some other cultural traditions that just feel very binding and feel very strong for other cultures. And the closest we come in America is like Super Bowl Sunday or you know, exchanging prisons at Christmas Day or something like that, putting up Christmas trees. So this season is the time of year where we actually think about tradition and talk about tradition. But I feel like the other 11 months out of the year, it just kind of falls by the wayside. Mm, interesting. At first, I thought you were going to say that there was not a lot of American tradition around Christmas, which did not seem accurate to me. But you're saying... This is the only thing we have tradition around and that we are not necessarily brilliant the rest of the year at it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Which I think heightens the sense of enjoyment for everybody because, oh, we finally get to go into the tradition side of the year. And every year we, I don't know, every family has their thing. For most people, they put up a Christmas tree and they put up lights and sometimes there's like cookies involved and, you know, wrapping presents and I don't know, various things that people hold their hat on and they just look forward to because this is what you do at that time of year. Um, We have certain music that we listen to and we have certain events that we attend, like you're talking about this concert or uh, this play that you're going to. So like there are things that we do, we just know are going to be part of our schedule. And I think that's what people love about the Christmas season is doing all those tradition things. Absolutely. Well, and and what's interesting to me is I think that we as a culture are fully engaged on every sensory level about this. You know, there are things we hear, music starts playing, and we all complain about how early it starts playing, but we all complain with a smile. (laughs) Um, Right? Um, Yeah. So we we hear different things, like you said, the lights, we see different things, the world, like the the outlook on the world changes, the world, like the physical world changes around us. Uh, Mm. But even I, I was thinking how amazing it is that something as simple as a latte becomes a peppermint latte. And if I gave you a peppermint latte any time of the year, it would mean Christmas because peppermint means Christmas. Right. Or it's funny, my daughter and I, it was even before Thanksgiving, my daughter and I walked into a major grocery store out here in Oregon 
And the, the second we stepped in, the pungent smell of cinnamon was just blasting through mm. the wall, through the window or through the door rather. And it was so overwhelming when you first walked in and you go, and so talking about different senses, like, cinnamon or apple spice or whatever these yes. are the the smells of christmas and our marketing geniuses out there have very much bought into that and make sure they pump it through their vents in the stores so that we're going to be happy shoppers i don't know yeah no but and i i for once am not going to take the role of criticizing the stores I think it is really interesting and valuable to have a cultural shared tradition as a society that is this all encompassing. But before we start digging in more into our Christmas traditions, whether personal, familial, or societal, the thing that I want to back up on, the starting point for me needs to be more basic. What is a tradition and why do they matter? This comes back to, you know, when I was in high school, I was on the debate team and the first thing you had to do was define your terms. Now I'm a 40-something and I am training to be a professional uh, leadership coach. And one of the first things that leadership coaching requires you to do is pay attention to people's words and make sure that you help them know what they mean by words because we are so sloppy in the way that we use words. So when you think of the idea of a tradition, what do you mean by a tradition? I feel like there's a lot of pressure in this moment to outdo Webster. And I've got to come up with the exact right definition because I don't want to be imprecise in my words. Though your point is well taken, and I appreciate it. it, you have to do the same thing in theology. Yeah, but you're right. The danger is you can almost slow down or foul up the creative process as you're brainstorming or thinking about things if you try too hard. And so you're right. In thinking about things, it's so important to give us ourselves this sort of balance of, okay, what do I mean? But it's not even what does Webster mean? It's not even what is the right answer? It's what do you mean when you think about tradition? Yeah, I mean, I am an American. I am a part of a culture that really only does this one month out of the year. So I feel very inadequate to define what a tradition is. I would say it's a shared experience. I don't think it's a, something you do by yourself. I think maybe you'd call that something like a ritual or something. But so I think it's a mm. shared experience that you do at a certain time and place and you do it in much the same way to commemorate an event or to celebrate an event. I think that's my first stab at Webster Jr. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's good. I think that's good. So you're commemorating something and you're commemorating it with people and you're commemorating it in the same way over and over again. And I would add, I think for me, as I think about traditions in my own life, I think the first time you do something, it's novel, right? Mm. Then there comes this time period where it's interesting and the novelty wears off. And then if you're in a group, you keep doing it. If you choose to keep doing it, you keep doing it because of the group, not because of the thing itself anymore. And in that moment, I think it becomes a tradition. It becomes a shared experience that is about the group, not about the thing. I see how the group is necessary for making it lasting. But what do you mean specifically when you say it's about the group and not about the thing? Oh, that's good. Um, I was trying to think of an example. So I will, I will come back to the play that I am going to see with my family. I have seen Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol performed live every year since I was five in the same theater. So that is... 40, 30, 
some odd number of times that I have seen. There is one year that my family skipped going to this. We decided for that one year we were going to be upscale and go to the Nutcracker Suite, which was also being performed across town. And one year of trying that out and we're like, nope, let's go back to the thing we like. Um, (laughs) You know, that one with words, let's do that one. Um, And I could not know a Christmas carol better than I do. I did not actually read the book until several years ago. And come to find out, I don't need to read the book. (laughs) <laughs> I have it almost memorized Yeah. beyond all the times everybody else sees it. Cause I also typically end up watching some movie version of it every single year. I mean, I have seen this probably 50 to 60 times. Jeez. It is no longer about a Christmas carol for me. It is no longer about a Christmas carol for anybody who goes with me. My parents live in Rhode Island and If you are from Rhode Island, you know what version of A Christmas Carol I'm talking about. You guys all go. It is a statewide tradition to go to Trinity Repertory Company in December to watch A Christmas Carol. The whole state does it. But (laughs) we all know the story. It's not about the story anymore. It's about the group of people you're doing it with. It becomes an, an identifying marker that we are a community. Yes. You know, it's so funny. I hadn't thought about this before until this very moment when I had a chance to come out and visit you when you still lived out in the Boston area. And we went to a Red Sox game. And something Mm -hmm. that is unique to Fenway Park, during the seventh inning stretch, you have to sing Sweet Caroline. Yes. And nobody, no other ballpark does that, at least to my knowledge. That's not a seventh inning stretch tradition. But the entire Fenway Park Stadium sings it together, including the bum, 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 you know. Especially the bum, bum, bum part. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And it's, uh, like you said, it's a shared identity. We are at Fenway Park We are Boston fans. We are singing this song. Yes. Uh, If you are, this is just to let you know how prolific this tradition is. It is not just in the ballpark. If you were in a mall and heard Sweet Caroline play, if you were in a restaurant and heard Sweet Caroline play, if you were on the street and for some reason you heard Sweet Caroline play and you were anywhere near Boston, everybody would shout out the bump, bump, bump thing. That's awesome. It is deeply ingrained in the culture. Now, I was at Lambert's my second week back in Missouri a year and a half, two years ago when we moved, and uh, my family had left to go into the gift shop, and I was just waiting for the check to come back to me, and on the speakers in Lambert's, which is the most Missouri-ish restaurant you can possibly experience and just Over flat this, amazing yes delightful wonderful glorious restaurant i love it it is one of the things i take anybody who ever comes to the area to i love it but in this moment i was sitting there by myself and over the speakers starts playing sweet caroline and when it came to that part of the song i started to shout it out <laughs> And, and were you the only one? Quite quickly, that I was the only one. Uh. And first of all, fortunately, Lambert's is a very loud restaurant. This is not an, a fine dining, elegant kind of experience. This is like a down home country kind of experience. So everybody's mm. loud and nobody noticed. But I will tell you, it is the single most profound sense of misting Boston and loneliness for my old life, I think that I have had since I got here. Of all the things I miss, and I am not a go to the Red Sox games, like it's expensive. I I went 
maybe once every other year. But the sense of isolation, because I had lost my people, because I was the only one and no one else knew my tradition, was very weirdly, but humorously isolating for me. Yeah. And I think that speaks to tradition's power so well. And I think it's why songs like I'll Be Home for Christmas and those kinds of things strike such a chord with people because they want to be back with their people doing their traditional things. Mm, That's good. One of the things that we love at Christmas time that we do every year is our annual gingerbread party. And this started Mm. for us like 12 or 13 years ago. I can't even count anymore. And Shelly inherited an old cast iron mold where you can actually bake gingerbread house pieces into the mold. And you flip it over and there's another house design. So there's like a Victorian house on one side and a log cabin house on one side. And you pack the mold with your gingerbread dough and you bake it. And then you pull it out and you have to do it again because you only get half of the house parts, like a roof and a wall and a side wall and whatever. And anyway, so she inherited this and we said, okay, well, we got to like do this. So we had some friends over and we made we built the houses and decorated them and it was great. And it just kept happening year after year after year after year. And it is a part, it is not a part, it is probably the main feature of our Christmas tradition as a family to do the gingerbread party. But one of the questions I have always had is, when are we going to outgrow this? Because our kids aren't little anymore. This is kind of a little kid activity, or at least it's billed as such. And all of our friends have now built many, many houses over the years. They know the drill. It's not novel anymore. But we keep doing it. Like you said, it's much more about the group. And so one of my questions is for my kids, what is it going to look like? Are they going to do the gingerbread party if they live in a different state? Are they going to come home to do the gingerbread party? But one thing is clear. If they can't do the gingerbread party, I know their Christmas will feel incomplete. Hmm. First of all, I have been hearing about this gingerbread party for over a decade. It yes. is the first question I ask you when I kn- I always know what weekend it's happening. I can't even say what day because sometimes it's been multiple days. Um, <laughs> right. I had no idea it all started with a pan. I That's just a great piece of trivia about your life that I didn't know. Yeah. But... I'm super wishing it was the Witch Josh question. Witch Josh started his favorite Christmas tradition because of a pan. Um, (laughs) But we'll have to get to Witch Josh later and that ain't it. You know, the second thing I, I said, what is tradition and why does it like, what makes it important? What does tradition do for us? A piece of it is it gives us a sense of corporate identity, right? This is who we are. We're the people who fill in the blank. Well, and I I love that you just said it that way because you and I have often talked about Christian formation as a process of asking this question. Am I the type of person who fill in the blank or I want mm. to become the type of person who fill in the blank or even just adopting that identity even if it is premature. I am the type of person who, because that's who you want to live into. And Mm. all of a sudden, a tradition, a corporate identity gets formed and you become a part of that. And so not only am I the type of person who, but we are the type of people who celebrate Christmas by having a gingerbread party every single year. Like, I am that type of person. Yep. And it communicates... One of the things I love about traditions is that they communicate our values in an unstated way. They embody rather than articulating our values, if that makes sense. Mm. You know, I have for years and years known that your home 
And bringing people into your home is a really high value for you. Mm -hmm. So I am on no, no level shocked that your favorite Christmas tradition as a family is bringing people into your home to build little homes. <laughs> right? Like, yeah, when you put it that way. Of course way. it is. <laughs> you know? Right. Of course it is. Right. Yeah. You know? But I also feel like I never having been there, I can guess the vibe of this event just by knowing you. It is not going to be quiet. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be super energetic. There's going to be people and stuff everywhere. There's going to be the like warm family version of chaos, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. um, and everything about what I envision, of course, I've only seen pictures, but I envision it. Though we digitally participated one year. Thank you, yes. COVID. You gave me the opportunity to participate in an event I had long wished to participate in. The right. year that the gingerbread party went digital. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I I really think our traditions embody and therefore communicate our values and priorities in really subtle and powerful ways. They do. And it's funny, as you are talking about this, I'm so struck by church liturgy and kind of the high church model. And somehow or another, a number of evangelical groups, of which my Baptist upbringing is one of them, kind of shun liturgy as rote, as meaningless, as repetitive, and forget that it does that same thing of creating a shared identity, communicating a set of sense of values, and imparting a place of belonging for people and some hooks to hang your hat on for going through your life. So it makes me really long to engage liturgy more based on what you're saying. Absolutely. Well, and the thing about, I think, tradition is it makes me want to build them carefully, build them intentionally. You know, like I said, traditions communicate something. To this day, it would be a non-starter of a conversation to say to my parents, we will not be attending, we don't even call it a Christmas carol, it's, we just call it the name of the theater. We will not be attending Trinity this year. That would be a non-starter of a conversation. But if I called my parents and said, hey, we have 18 friends who are all going to be in town the day we're doing Trinity, can we bring all of them? <laughs> my mom and dad would be like, yeah, absolutely. Of course. What do we have to do to make that happen? Let's do it. And it, it speaks to the high priority on family, but family as an inclusive unit that my family has always had. Anybody's welcome to be family if you're interested in doing the things we're doing. And if you mm. want to participate, by all means. And... It just makes me think if tradition communicates so much, you know, and then I jump back to the peppermint lattes and gingerbread smells. I think traditions can be like worship songs. They can be musically extraordinary. They can also be theologically rich. They can also be both and they can also be neither. Hmm. Or they can be one or the other. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think tradition can probably be the same. It can be deeply moving and or theologically rich. But the fact that it's deeply moving doesn't mean it's theologically rich. But it doesn't mean it shouldn't be deeply moving either. Right. Yeah. I guess the my analogy then would be Super Bowl Sunday. Yes, please going back say to that. something because what I'm saying is like <laughs> I'm tripping all over the place over here. <laughs> you want to go back to singing? Would that help? Uh, Tradition. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, my my analogy would be 
uh, football and Super Bowl Sunday. And many families have their ritual around Super Bowl Sunday. And maybe you make a big old pot of chili or you have your favorite drinks or you have, you know, certain people that always come over or you always go to so-and-so's house and you do your football ritual and you look forward to it. You're excited by it. If that's the the kind of thing you're into, I, I get other people are like, yeah, bring on the puppy bowl. I'm not into football, but you know, for those who find that meaningful, they have their liturgy, they have their ritual, they have their tradition around it and they can get very, excited, emotionally very happy to engage the ritual or the tradition, but it's there's no depth there, right? Whoever wins the Super Bowl yeah. isn't going to really change your life, but it, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means if you're trying to be intentional about the way you form rituals, they can't all be like the football Super Bowl moment. Some of them have to have some greater depth to them. Yes, and no criticism intended towards the Super Bowl, ba 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 kinds of, I meant those as separate things. I, I do understand that the Red Sox are not, and the Super Bowl are different sports. Um, <laughs> but uh, those are fine. Those are kind of social and cultural identifiers that we participate in, and it's great. But yeah, traditions that point to something greater are equally and perhaps more valuable. For example, and I this technically doesn't qualify as a tradition because I do it by myself every year, but one of my own private Christmas traditions, one of the ways I keep Christmas about the things I want it to be about is that I listen to Handel's Messiah regularly during the advent season Hmm. and at least once during the advent season i will sit down and listen to or watch the entire thing Hmm. and that is deeply meaningful to me it is not easy music to appreciate though again when you've heard it beyond its novelty which is what we often enjoy music for that's why we think of music as disposable But once we get beyond the novelty and really start to saturate in the genius of it, which takes work, like you have to dig into certain this kind of music, it's profound. And whether anybody else, I don't care if anybody else particularly likes oratorio or whatever that kind of music is called, but for me, it points in the right direction. It gets me thinking about Jesus. It gets me thinking yeah. about incarnation, and that's valuable to me. Man, that super excites me. I actually think you mentioned two things right there, and I would love to make sure we spend some time this Christmas talking about these two things. One, I would love to know more. I would like to dive in to forming traditions or forming rituals or what have you around You said, you know, keeping Christmas focused on the main thing. The trite phrase in our society is keeping Christ in Christmas. I actually would love to have a meaningful conversation about how to do that genuinely, not because of some societal obligation. And then you also talked about that Handel's Messiah gets you thinking about the incarnation. And that is ultimately what Christmas is about. I would love to have a whole conversation just devoted to the incarnation and trying to unpack that mysterious, awesome reality. Uh, So, man, well, we've got a couple weeks till Christmas. Let's do one next week and one the week after. That sounds amazing to me. I would love it. So I'm excited. This has really set us up really well to, yeah, let's do it. Nice. We just fell into an Advent series. (laughs) We sure did. Well, now that we know where we're going in future episodes, maybe this is a good time to pause this conversation and turn to the audience and just say, thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of our Christmas season. And I hope that you are enjoying whatever it is you are doing, whatever traditions you're engaging in. And I hope that you are surrounded by friends and family and moments that bring you closer to Christ. 
As we talked about last week, we would love if you took some time to capture a moment from your day, from your week, and use the hashtag, Come Lord Jesus. That is what we are anticipating together this Advent. Come Lord Jesus. So keep those pictures, those thoughts coming. Use that hashtag, follow that hashtag to see what other people are posting. And then if you've enjoyed this episode or any other episode from our podcast, please, we would love for you to share it, share it with friends, family, start a great conversation around whatever activity you are doing together this holiday season. And finally, you can follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, just search for On the Phone with Josh. We have content coming out nearly every single day, just showing you a little bit about what we're doing and what you can expect on the podcast. So hope to see you all online. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, before we're done, though, I'm curious, what else are you thinking about? Well, this is an incomplete thought. And My it's really... My favorite kind. I feel very <laughs> at home with them. <laughs> right. You know, when somehow or another you've engaged a verse multiple times in a week, not because you tried to, but because it just keeps coming up. And you go, okay, maybe I should be paying attention to that verse somehow, some way. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the moment I'm in three separate times. The passage in Mark 10 has come up about the blind man, Bartimaeus, and he is yelling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And everybody's like trying to get him to be quiet. And he's like yelling all the louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus walks up to him and says, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, I, I want to receive my sight. And he heals him and all those things. But the thing that has been the consistent question posed in all three times I have heard this mentioned is taking a moment to ask God or to allow God to ask you rather, what do you want me to do for you? And have a meaningful just genuine, what rises up from your heart? Like that guy he wanted to see. Nothing else could be more prominent for him than that need. What is most prominent for me? What do I want God to do? And the first time I engaged with that question, I sat down and I felt like I had an answer and talked with God a little bit, but it's come up twice more. So I'm like, maybe I didn't answer right. <laughs> so, um, so that's my question. What do I want God to do for me? And I'm putting it here on the podcast so that I know when I listen to this in a couple of weeks, it's going to remind me, are you asking that question? That's really good. There's this great Lord of the Rings quote that is in there several times. In moments like this, Gandalf or whoever the main character is in the given moment will say, a strange chance it was, if chance it was. <laughs> and... That's their way of hinting. Maybe it was chance. Maybe it wasn't. But we may be seeing the fingerprints of something beyond in that kind of a moment. Yep. It does make me pause. Okay. I need to sit mm -hmm. with that question, I think. That's good. Yeah. So what are you thinking about? Oh, man. Uh, I will... I have two things I've been thinking about, and I was trying to figure out which one I was going to talk about. And so here we go. Uh, the thing that I am thinking about really most today is that uh, several weeks ago, we were at church. We'd run out of Bibles to give away. And I am somewhat philosophically opposed to being at church and not being able to give somebody a Bible. So I gave them I gave the person who was looking up for a Bible that particular Sunday my personal Bible, the one that I regularly read, which is very seldom has it collected much dust because I have done this several times. And I've been thinking about replacing it. And, you know, there's such a wide range of Bibles that yeah. I get stuck when I think about replacing a Bible and... Here's the stuckness that I have this particular time. I know what Bible I want to buy, and it is gorgeous, and it is 98 bucks. 
and I could just as easily get the exact same set of words for about 1998. <laughs> And I could live without buying any print Bible because I can see it on my, I mean, and I have all sorts of other versions of the Bible. I mean, it's not like I can't find a print Bible around me, but to have a Bible that I call my Bible, that is the one I always go to, I am stuck on, am I comfortable spending 98 bucks on something that I could get for 1998? And so I'm bringing that up so you can solve it for me. Go. That is funny. I'll. It just happens to coincide with a story I just heard in my Christian formation class. And we had a guest speaker today. And the guest speaker was talking about creating a rule of life and talking about some of the spiritual processes that he has gone through, some of the examine sorts of observations that he's made in his life. And he's realized that one of the things that he lacks is kind of a create creativity, spontaneity, joy, sort of that super flexible, getting a lot of enjoyment out of life sort of mentality. And he told this story. He was at a store. He saw some tennis shoes he loves shoes, evidently. And he found these tennis shoes and he loved them. And he, But he thought they were a little silly. Like maybe he shouldn't be buying them because they're just kind of odd and silly. And he felt like God stepped into that moment and said, would you buy these for your kids? He's like, heck yeah, I'd buy them for my kids. They're awesome. And God was like, all right, so buy them, enjoy them, have a little fun. And that was something that he just needed to hear in that moment. So I don't know. I correlate those because they literally happen hours apart from one another. Maybe you should just buy them. And maybe if it helps, it sounds like you're probably going to give this Bible away at some point. How cool is it to like give them the Cadillac Bible because you weren't too cheap and just went out and bought a Honda Accord? First of all, let's never criticize Hondas. (laughs) <laughs> fair for real like i mean we're almost done with our conversation so you have plenty of time later to repent it's okay um <laughs> god can forgive you know and more and more i find myself leaning this way i think that it is okay to enjoy to celebrate and I am a giant advocate of live within the budget. So oh, for sure. certainly this is, this is not a knee-jerk purchase. Honestly, I've spent the last couple years thinking through if I were going to get a Bible. This, it just happens to be on sale right now. It's normally like $200. But wow. um, yeah, it's real goat skin leather, which raises a whole other issue that I don't care about. But... <laughs> and yeah, sorry. Peter, really you have just lost the opportunity to sponsor. <laughs> to sponsor this. <laughs> it's true. Please don't sponsor our episodes. I would have to stop doing a lot of things. Um, <laughs> yeah, sometimes I think the Christian message is relax and enjoy. It's okay. Yeah, sometimes it is. And, you know, it's funny. I think we've talked on the ups, on the podcast before. Sometimes what is a spiritual discipline for one is something that somebody else might need to actually move away from. And so I think you are bent toward frugality and toward it has to ha- be utilitarian. It has to be wise. It has to all of these things. And this is an opportunity for you to open up. Whereas somebody else might be a very big freewheeling spending person and their spiritual discipline might be to clamp down. So Mm. for you in the way that you are built, yeah, enjoy. Well, and and this raises a different topic that I am just going to say this online so that I don't forget before we get offline. But I would love to have a conversation about discernment. Yeah, that would be good. So... I'm just saying that. But uh, on a far more prosaic note, this last week, I posted 
a very important question for the holidays, and that is, which Josh thinks Die Hard is absolutely a Christmas movie? I'm not going to keep anybody in suspense. That is me, Josh from Oregon. I love watching that movie every year. And my kids are finally old enough that we can watch it together. And it just brings back so many memories. I I remember watching all the Die Hard movies as a kid. We had them on a VHS pack, like the box with the smaller VHS boxes in it. Yeah. Again, not surprising anybody, I had all the Star Trek movies like that. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we had the the box set of Die Hard movies, and I love them. They're just so much fun, and I know it's it goes against the grain of everything we've done on this podcast, but you know, the very last line in every single one of those with the yippee ki yay man, it's just so satisfying. So... <laughs> There you go. That's my advice. I genuinely have only seen Die Hard once, and my recollection is that it is a fairly bland, stereotypical action movie. I don't know which one of us needs to repent right now. (laughs) You, you said that, you like said Accords weren't a good car. I'm still upset about that. (laughs) Uh, All right. Well, we'll work on repentance and reconciliation uh, between now and next week. Yeah, we will. So, so long as you can forgive me, are we on for next week? Yes, I'll pray about it. Okay. I hope to talk to you then. All right, I'll talk to you later. All right, bye.